The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, okay, settle down. It's time to start learning. Um, one announcement, tomorrow we'll have the uh, weekly quiz in lieu of the Tuesday uh, celebration. We're going to move to Thursday since the uh, holiday moved everything, compressed the week. So um, last day we were talking about doping of semiconductors, and I want to finish up that unit. Um, just to refresh your memories, we, we looked at how we could change the behavior of the semiconductor by introducing impurity atoms. And when the behavior of the semiconductor is dominated by the impurity atoms, we uh, term that behavior extrinsic. In other words, it's not the behavior of silicon itself, but it's the behavior of silicon as determined by the presence of some uh, dopant atom. And we looked at the special case of doping with a supervalent impurity. And here's the energy level diagram for that situation where we've got the valence band down here, we've got the conduction band up here separated by an energy gap. And that's all characteristic of, of plain vanilla silicon. But then when we dope with the supervalent impurity, there is an extra electron. And that is put into a donor level that lies just a tiny bit below the bottom of the conduction band. And then thanks to thermal excitation, which gives us an average energy of about uh, 40th of an electron volt, we get, for all intents and purposes, 100% excitation of the electrons that sit in the donor level, excitation up into the conduction band. And this is what the electrical engineers term ionization. And I also reminded you last day that this is the donor level. And for each donor atom, there sits a donor level at the same value of energy, but these are so far apart owing to the dilution, the dilute concentration of the uh, impurity that we don't violate the Pauli exclusion principle. So these are all sitting at the same level, and that's why the given temperature promotes all of them up into the conduction band where they are mobile. And then, uh, just to complete the review, we call this n-type because thanks to doping, we generate electrons in the conduction band, and electrons are negative. Uh, supervalent dopant gives us n-type. Then the total number of electrons in the conduction band is the sum of those that would have been generated by plain old thermal excitation. Thermal excitation operates all the time. So with thermal excitation, recall we promote from the valence band up into the conduction band. So we break one of these bonds, shoot an electron up here, and leave a hole behind. So this generates the pair, hole in the valence band and electron in the conduction band. That's always operative, but owing to the energies involved, the band gap is on the order of one electron volt, whereas the donor level sits only about 1 50th of an electron volt below the conduction band. So we get very, very little promotion at room temperature. And in fact, it's something like 10 to the minus 19 is the fraction of promotion. And if you say roughly 10 to the 23rd per cubic centimeter, that means you got about 10 to the fourth electrons per cubic centimeter due to this thermal excitation from the valence band to the conduction band. Normally, when you dope a semiconductor, you dope it around parts per million level. And parts per million, that's 10 to the minus 6. If you take 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the 23, you get about 10 to the 17. And you can see 10 to the 17 is vastly larger than 10 to the 4th. So for all intents and purposes, once you've doped something, this contribution is essentially 0. And so the electron population, the conduction band, is that dictated by the impurity atoms, which is why we say that this is exhibiting extrinsic behavior. The intrinsic properties are, are not visible. They're not palpable, and immeasurable. So intrinsic is substantially less than extrinsic. And the last thing I wanted to do for you before we, 
we say goodbye to this fascinating topic, which lays the groundwork for everything that we know in the modern electronic era, parenthetically, um, is to look at the other type of doping. I've shown you how to make an n-type semiconductor. How do we make a p-type semiconductor? So in that case, what we can do is dope with a subvalent impurity. Dope with subvalent impurity. What do I mean by subvalent? Well, the valency of silicon is 4. So I want something less than 4. So a good example is boron into silicon. Boron into silicon. All right, so boron is group 13 or 3. All right, if you look on your periodic table, and silicon is group 14 according to the UPAC notation. So let's go back and, and take a look at how that might appear. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw the silicon crystal. Remember, this is going into a single crystal of silicon. So silicon is sp3 hybridized, and we have silicons everywhere in the structure. So we're going to put silicons. And I'm trying to show sp3 hybridization. So this is three legs, each in, in, in the plane. Then you've got 109 degrees here. So the silicon and so on. I get three of them just to complete enough of the picture. And then what we're going to do is introduce boron. And boron goes into the silicon lattice and covalently bonds. It doesn't go sit in some void space in between the silicons. It actually sits on a silicon site and substitutes for the silicon. Now, boron is group 13. It's got three valence electrons, and so it forms bonds with three silicons. And now, there's a fourth silicon here, and that silicon has an electron, but the boron doesn't have a fourth electron. Here's where it gets interesting. The, the driving force to complete the picture here is so great that the system will actually pull an electron out of a silicon-silicon bond. Pull an electron out of a silicon-silicon bond, and so I'm going to use a different color chalk, and I'm going to indicate, just for argument's sake, that we're going to pull an electron out of this bond here, break this bond, and shoot that electron over to here. That way we get four bonds around the boron. It's sp3 hybridized. It just doesn't have that extra electron. But now it rips the electron out of this silicon-silicon bond. And what's the consequence of breaking this bond? What's the electrical feature that we've created here? A hole. So now we've created a hole somewhere else in the crystal in order to satisfy the desire of boron to get that fourth bond. And now can you see that for every boron that I introduce into the crystal, I'm going to make a hole somewhere in the crystal. And on the energy level diagram, where do those holes live? Those holes live in the valence band. So let's go make the energy level diagram. So up here we have the conduction band. And downstairs we have the valence band as before. And I'm going to assume that we got the thermal promotion, but it's so tiny in comparison to the amount of boron that go we're going to put in. I'm not going to muddy the water here and show that you've got pair uh, formation, because the extent of it is so small, it doesn't make any difference. So now what happens? Now I know I'm going to generate holes here, and I've got to show this energy level. And this bonding level is different from this bonding level, agreed? Silicon-silicon bond has different bond energy from boron-silicon bond. So that means the top of the valence band is different from, because this valence band is silicon, silicon, silicon. So it turns out that, and this is not to scale, that the energy level of this bond is just a little bit higher. And this is an energy level that involves the accepting of electrons, whereas in the other case, we were donating electrons. Hence, that's called the donor level. This is called the acceptor level. This is called the acceptor level. And it's about a 50th of an electron volt above the top of the valence band. And so what happens is that in order to make this bond, we move something out of the valence band up into the acceptor level and generate a hole. And so for every boron that we put in, we have another broken bond. And all of these lie at the same level, but the dilution is so high that they're so far apart that they don't violate the Pauli exclusion principle, and they're thermally promoted up, and away we go. So now 
under these circumstances, the number of negative charge carriers no longer equals the number of positive charge carriers. Because I've got all these positive charge carriers thanks to the introduction of boron, P is greater than N. So we've made a P-type semiconductor, P-type semiconductor by the introduction of a subvalent impurity. And we can redo the entire central part of last day's lesson, which was the Bohr model. Now, this is the sexiest part of the Bohr model I've ever seen. This is really, really cool. The hole is mobile. The hole is mobile. And the boron, the boron is a little bit shy of protons, right? The boron's shy of protons. It's, it's three in a land of four. So it's negative. So I've got a stationary negative center, a stationary negative center, and I've got something positive revolving around a negative center. This is an inverse Bohr model. Because the Bohr model has a honking big positive center with a dinky little electron revolving around. We've got the immobile negative center and the mobile hole revolving around. Go through and you get the same set of quantum. I mean, there's a whole bunch of quantum levels in here. and everything. It's fantastic how far that Bohr model can take us. So now, you know how to make a P-type semiconductor, you know how to make an N-type semiconductor. And then what you can do, what you can do is then put them together. And you can put, say, boron-doped, boron-doped silicon opposite phosphorus-doped silicon. Be careful here. Uh, the, the fonts are really critical. This is uppercase P for phosphorus. This is lowercase p for positive doping. So don't go, oh, p, phosphorus, that means it's p-type. No, p gives you extra electrons. It's n-type. So that's an uppercase p. This is a lowercase p. This is p-type. This is p-type. So now I've got p-type, n-type. And so what do I have here? I've got a p n junction. And this is the beginning of solid state devices, rectification of AC current, diodes, you name it. And it all starts with this. It all starts with this, the chemistry. This is the birth of the transistor. Transistor. And all the modern electronics that we have is based on this. And later on, we'll show you how you get the boron in and how you get the phosphorus in. You don't just come in and sprinkle it on top and hope that it goes to the lattice sites. There's a lot of processing involved. OK, so this is where I want to hold for the, uh, the unit on semiconductors and, and uh, how it fit into the grand scheme of things. So you know, in the books, you'll see here's a, this, is a, this is a very crude drawing, because this is showing n-type semiconductor with, with grossly exaggerated numbers of uh, donor electrons up here. There's no mention of the donor level. So this is sort of um, semiconductivity. Uh, sort of pre-3091. This is, this is uh, uh, semicondu extrinsic semiconduction for idiots, I guess you'd call it. And then the same thing here. You see all of the holes in the, in the valence band. We know better, because we know there's an acceptor level and there's a donor level. OK. So now we're going to uh, switch gears. Now, we're, now Here's the big transition right now. If the last two lectures didn't leave high school behind, today we leave high school behind. So those of you who have been coasting up until now, thanks to your very good high school background, start paying attention because it's high school no more. So just to remind you where we've come, we started over here uh, at the beginning of the semester. And the big theme is going to be electronic structure informs bonding, which informs state of aggregation. State of aggregation is solid, liquid, or gas. OK, so I want to I show you how we get to where we are. So we did all of these topics, right? Bohr, or Sommerfeld quantum numbers, multi-electron. And then we came to octet stability. And with octet stability, we went a long way. We got into ionic bonding. We got into uh, completing the sh valence shell. And in fact, all of this is a consequence of the octet stability. And that led us into the various types of primary bonding, ionic, covalent, metallic, and in some instances, van der Waals. Solid argon is van der Waals bonding. It's the only kind of bonding, so it's a primary bonding. But in some cases, like HCl, how do you get liquid HCl? How do you get 
solid methane. So we had to invoke secondary bonding for some of these covalent molecules, and that invoked dipole-dipole interaction, the London dispersion force, which is the same as the van der Waals bond, but I decided to mix things up so that both men get a little bit of attention, none of them feel slighted, and finally hydrogen bonding in those special instances. And that allowed us to then determine whether something was a gas, a liquid, or a solid. And when it's a solid, we're happy, because this is 3091, and we're interested in a solid state. By the way, what is a solid? Well, here's an operative definition. That which is dimensionally stable has a volume of its own. It doesn't distort in a gravity field. Right? Liquids will distort. Fluids, gases will distort. Now, there's two ways of classifying solids. One is bonding type. That's what we did here. But the second way of classifying solids is based on atomic arrangement. All right? So let's look at that. There's only two types of atomic arrangement, ordered and disordered. Right? I, love, I love these taxonomies that split everything into a choice of two. That way you just sort of go through life and decide, is it left or is it right? Is it up or is it down? Is it ordered or is it dis disordered? So what are the characteristics of an ordered solid? It has a regular atomic arrangement. That means it's got a long range order. And I'll show you that in an ordered solid, I know not only where my next nearest neighbor is, where my 10th nearest neighbor is, I know where my 152nd nearest neighbor is, because it's an ordered solid. And we have a simple Anglo-Saxon word for an ordered solid. It's called crystal. Crystal. So when I say something is a metallic crystal, I don't mean it's something that's got magical properties, and if I put it over my head, I get powerful or something. It just means I've got atoms in an atomic regular arrangement. Now, contrasting to that is a disordered solid. And in that case, we have a random arrangement. But I put an asterisk here, because as they say in California, it's not totally random. It's only random up to a point. No long range order. There may be short range order. In other words, I know what my next nearest neighbor is, but I probably don't know where my 10th nearest neighbor is. Because the coordination shell is established, but the next coordination shell and the next coordination shell, they are not established. And I'm going to show you with examples what that means. So we call those kinds of disordered solids amorphous solids, as opposed to the regular solids, which are crystalline solids. And there's a plain Anglo-Saxon word for a disordered solid. It's glass. It's glass. Now, you might think, well, gee, doesn't glass mean that it's, uh, it's transparent to visible light? No, no. Maybe up until now, but I want everybody who's ever taken 3091 from me to be disabused of the notion that glass means transparent. How do we think about the question of transparency? And here I mean transparency vis-a-vis -vis visible light. I'm not going to say what's transparent to x-rays. That's, that's a pedantry. So how do we think about whether something is transparent to visible light? We just ask ourselves, is the band gap greater than 3 electron volts? the band gap's greater than 3 electron volts, visible light zooms right through. It doesn't have enough energy to excite the electrons, be absorbed, and re-emit. So that's what transparency means. So I can have the kind, of, the kind of material that's used in things like eyeglasses. It's transparent to visible light because of its high band gap. Diamond. Diamond is transparent to visible light. And you wouldn't dare insult diamond by saying that diamond is glass. In fact, that's, you go watch the old gangster movies from the 1930s. That was the derogatory term for fake diamonds. You call them glass. So how is it that diamond, which is crystalline, is transparent to visible light? And yet the window glass that we have is transparent to visible light. It has nothing to do with state of order. It has everything to do with this. In fact, uh, David, if we could shoot to the document camera, I'll show you a piece of glass that's not transparent to visible light. Uh, how do we zoom in on this thing? OK. Autofocus. So what I'm showing you is a piece of obsidian. Obsidian. It's a naturally occurring mineral. It's rich in silica, and it's, it's turned dark because it's got some iron impurity, and the iron absorbs in the visible. And this is clearly not transparent to visible light, and yet it is a disordered solid. This is a glassy solid. In fact, the, the white speckles there, the white speckles there are 
de-vitrified obsidian. It's actually started to crystallize. So the crystalline form is the part that's, that's transparent. If you could peel off this crystalline form, you'd actually end up with something that's transparent to visible light. So here's an example of where the crystalline form is transparent to visible light, and the glassy form is opaque. So glass has nothing to do with transparency. This is, this is how you think about the question of transparency. OK, so let's cut back to the, let's cut back to the uh, slides, David, please. All right, so we're, we're going to start by looking at ordered solids. So we're going to take next several lessons and talk about ordered solids. And then after that, we're going to take a few more lessons and talk about disordered solids. Now, first of all, what, what's the term crystal? Where does it come from? It comes from the Greek word krystalos, which is the Greek word for ice. That's where we get the term crystalline. All right, so we're going to start with a history lesson. That's how we start everything in 3091, history lesson. So we're going way, way back to Isaac Newton's time, the Reformation, Charles, Oliver Cromwell, all those exciting times in merry old England. Where's Robert Hooke? You know him from Hooke's Law in mechanics. So he was doing military research in 1660. He was trying to understand what was the optimal way to stack cannonballs. So when you're in a battlefront, you want to figure out how to keep your materiel compactly arranged. You don't lie them on the ground. So from that, he concluded that a crystal, that is a regular array, must owe its shape to the packing of spherical particles. So that he was thinking, trying to imagine. Remember, Democritus said that we have these indivisible particles, but no one had ever seen them before. And then 1669, a Dane by the name of Steenson, who was working in Italy, was looking at quartz crystals. And he was studying various quartz crystals. By that, I mean quartz crystals of different sizes. And what he observed was it didn't matter what the size of the crystal was, they always had the same angles between corresponding faces. So if I give you a big crystal and a smaller crystal of the same material and a smaller crystal and they all have the same shape, can you imagine that you might conclude that that is reflective of something down at the atomic level? And if you could get down to the atomic level, that spatial arrangement would hold right down? Because that's how it grew, right? It started from a few small number of atoms and it grew, grew, grew. Why would it start with one shape and all of a sudden change to another shape? It doesn't make any sense, at least not to me, and certainly not to Steenson. And then we go to Holland, 1690, Christian Huygens. And he was studying calcite crystals. And he drew drawings of atomic packing and bulk shape. This is 1690. I'm going to show you an image from his book. This was drawn in 1690. See, it's the stacking of cannonballs, but he was looking at a calcite crystal. Actually, Dave, could we cut back to the document camera? We're going to do a fair bit of this. I'll show you a calcite crystal. This is what he had to work with, something that looked like this. All right, to give you a sense of scale, uh, what do I have? Have anything you'd recognize? OK, here's a soda can. I'll give you a sense of scale, OK? This is one honking big calcite crystal. I got it as a gift from someone who watched 3091 lectures on open courseware. And he said, if I ever come to town, can I attend your lecture? And I said, sure. And he showed up, attended the lecture. He was a man probably in his early 40s. And uh, as, uh, as a pastime, he collects uh, gemstones. And he gave me this giant calcite crystal, because the one I was using before was so pathetic. He said, I've got to give you one. And then I thought, geez, if I could ever come upon somebody who's in the gold business. and." <laughs> You know, he might give me a big honking crystal of face-centered cubic metal called gold, which broke $1,000 an ounce yesterday. But anyways, if you're out there and you're watching these lectures, I'm here. It's 8201, <laughs> and you can see me anytime. My assistant's name is Hillary. She'll take the call. All right, so let's go back to the, to the, to the slides. Dave, could we cut to the slides, please? Yeah, thanks. All right, so now. Uh, oh, I'm going to show you a few others. I'm going to show you a few others. Remember, here's, here's the idea that we're looking down to the elemental level. So if you look on your periodic table, it says tin. You see, tin is supposed to be tetragonal. So here's a crystal of tin. Dave, cut back, please. We're going to go back and forth today a lot. Here's a piece of tin. All right, so you might look at it and say, gee, that looks kind of, that looks sort of cubic. But if you look carefully, the vertical dimension the, is, is greater than the horizontal. In fact, it's got a square base. And then this is the, the tall one, which if we cut back to the slides, 
You'll see. And that's what tetragonal looks like. And we'll, we'll study all of these in a, in a few minutes. Um, these are some giant crystals I didn't dare drag in. This is, this is sort of human size scale. This is basalt, which is a, which is a magnesium iron silicate. It's on a coast of, uh, of Iceland. Uh, Dave, let's, let's show them a few more. Here's one more if we go to the document camera. This is beryllium aluminum silicate. This is a barrel. And you can see this has got a hexagonal habit. It's all hexagonal. So something's going on at the atomic level that's different as we go from one crystal structure to the other. What else have I got here? Oh, here's some calcite. Here's some fluorite. Look at this one. This is square pyramidal, but it's ionic. So don't give me any of that SP3D2 stuff, because that's not going to work here. OK. All right. OK, let's go back to the slides, please. All right, so then we jump to 1781 to France. René Justeuil was at the uh, Sorbonne, and he was studying the cleavage of calcite crystals. In other words, he was taking these things and breaking them. So he'd go to work every day and break things. And he studied the shards, and he found that the shards were all rhombohedral, the same shape as the parent crystal. No matter how small the shards got, they always looked like this. He didn't end up with cubic shards. He didn't end up with long slivers. He always ended up with rhombohedral slices. So the other thing is that he didn't end up with any voids. No matter how he cut this thing, he never got voids. So he reasoned that this must be the way things are packing in three space perfectly. So then he said, gee, if they pack perfectly rhombohedrally, we all know that we can stack boxes together perfectly, cubes together. So he, being a Frenchman, said, what's the mathematical formulation? They were steeped in, in mathematics there. That wasn't a slur against the French. It's a compliment. He said, what are the mathematically distinct shapes that if we stack them together in three space, they will fill three space with no voids? And the answer is seven. Seven space-filling volume elements. By the way, the gabled milk carton isn't one of them. Um, and so he called these the crystal system. So I call seven distinct shapes of milk cartons. And these are the seven crystal systems, and they're described geometrically, and you'll get a chance to go through them. The cube is one of them, tetragonal. Here's the, here's the calcite, rhombohedral. There's the barrel, hexagonal, and so on. There's seven different ways you can fill three, three space. And this is from the archival readings of my predecessor, Professor Witt. Actually, just to give you a sense, here's the two-dimensional analogy. If I said to you, uh, we're going to open a, a company and we're going to make bathroom tile, and we want to make it sort of an upscale company, you know, not everybody wants boring old square tiles. But definitely, I can cover two space with square tiles by putting them side by side, one on top of the other. What's another way I can fill? I can go with rectangular tiles. So this dimension is different from that dimension. What's another way? I can use a rhombus, right? At 60 degrees. Or I can use just a plain old parallelopiped at some arbitrary angle. And if you go over to the Stata Center, to the Gary Building, take a look at the shape that they chose as the unit cell. This is the repeat group, if you like, or the unit cell, because that's the one that's going to be cookie cut or replicated side by side. When you're putting the skin on a building, you have to make everything fit with no holidays, right? Because you don't want gaps. And the, what they chose was this, this volume, the, pardon me, this uh, um, area element. And all the pieces of stainless steel are cut to this shape. And that's how you make things fit. The, how, how you take something and make it fit around a three-dimensional object is, is tricky. It's the same thing as the clothing problem, right? How do you take a flat piece of cloth and make it fit the contour of the human body? At least, you know, in men's clothes, you know, we got dimensions. We got, you know, sleeve length, got waist, chest. So you got all these numbers. For a woman, eight. One number? <laughs> One number? Fashion designers don't know crystallography. If they knew crystallography, they'd know how to specify the shapes. If you understand this, you can start your own business and make clothes that fit. And I guarantee you, there's a market out there for clothes that fit. What about this one? 
Pentagon. We're going to make pent pentagonal bathroom tile. Well, we're going to have to send, when we, when we install these, we're going to have to use two different colors. You can see this up here, right? This is pentagonal bathroom tile. It doesn't fit. You've got all these white spots. So this is not a unit cell. This is not one of the crystal systems for two-dimensional. So this one's no good. We better put an X through it in case someone fell asleep and they wake up and then they'll tell me that that's okay. All right, so then we move about half a century forward to the turbulent year 1848, also in France, uh, Auguste Bravais. And what Bravais did is he said, all right, this is just filling space. But where are the atoms? I haven't told you where the atoms are, right? You know, as far as you're concerned, maybe there's one atom in each of these boxes. Or maybe there's atoms at the corners of the box. Or maybe there's atoms at the corner in the center of the box. Where are the atoms? I've simply told you that I can fill three space with boxes or with these rectangular boxes and so on. So he set out mathematically to prove how many different arrangements of points there are in space. It's sort of like saying, if I want to tell you where all the apples are in the orchard, I'm going to tell you where the trees are, and I'm going to tell you where the apples are in a tree. So where do the, where do the atoms go inside these boxes? Turns out there's 40, 40, uh, pardon me, 14 different arrangements. Now, what do I mean by that? This is a good example. So we've already established that the cube is a space-filling volume element. It's one of the seven. But look, if I'm one of the atoms at the corners here, I've got six nearest neighbors. This is also a cube, but it's got atoms at the corners and an atom in the center. You might say, well, what's the big deal? If you're the atom in the center and you look to the nearest neighbors, you've got eight nearest neighbors. Here you only have six nearest neighbors. So this is spatially differentiated from this. So why don't we keep going? So, and by the way, the, the same environment of that central atom that's coated green is the same environment of the, any of the atoms on the corners. They're all symmetric. So both are cubes, but they have different space point environments. And here's a third one where we put atoms at the corners and atoms on each of the faces. So this atom on the face, you can see it's got one, two, three, four atoms in the plane, uh, three behind, three in front. It's got 12 nearest neighbors. This has got eight nearest neighbors. It's got six nearest neighbors. So Brave went through and he said, Let's take those seven crystal systems, let's put atoms in distinguishable ways. How many distinguishable ways can we come up with atom arrangements? And the answer is 14. Well, what we're going to do in 3091 is we're just going to confine our conversation to the cubics because you use orthogonal vectors, they're all the same length, the mathematics is simple, and the principles are the same. By the way, boatloads of materials are in the cubic system, so it's not as though we just chose something that's um, convenient but irrelevant. So here are the different Bravais lattices. So you can see the cubic, there's simple cubic, body-centered cubic, face-centered cubic. With tetragonal, there is simple tetragonal and body-centered tetragonal. There's no face-centered tetragonal. If you try to make face-centered tetragonal, it's degenerate and it reverts to one of the other systems. So these are the distinguishable systems. And everything, including crystalline proteins, if the protein crystallizes, it forms atomic arrangements in one of these Bravais lattices. Everything conforms to one of these Bravais lattices. And if it doesn't, it means it lacks long-range order, in which case it is a glass. That's it. So here's face-centered cubic. You can see the, the placements. But there's something that's been... Uh, simplified here. Right now, what you see is a single atom designated by a hard sphere. But at each of these lattice points, at each of these lattice points, I can put more than one atom. So let me show you what I mean by that. So what I do is put different numbers of atom arrangements at the lattice point. So those positions, the distinguishable positions are called lattice points. And now I want to define the crystal structure the crystal structure is the complete accounting of atomic arrangement. It's the complete description of atomic arrangement. And we don't have to go too far, because we just have to get the base unit, the unit cell, and then just repeat the unit cell. Complete description of atomic arrangement. And so how are we going to go about this? We're going to start with a Bravais lattice. 
Bravais lattice. And what is the Bravais lattice? The Bravais lattice is simply a point environment. Point environment. And this will mean something to you in about three minutes when I, when I give you the rest of the description. So it's a set of points in space. And the basis. And what is the basis? The basis is the atom group at each lattice point. The atom group at each lattice point. So what do we mean by that? What do we mean by that? Well, let's, let's look at what's up on the board. What's up on the board is face-centered cubic. So let's do all of these. So we're going to say that the Brave lattice, in this case, the Brave lattice is face-centered cubic, FCC. That's what this one is up on the board. All right? And we've got dots to indicate the points, because really the points are nothing. It's a concept. See, it's French. It's a concept. Right? What's this? See what I'm holding? I'm holding a Brave lattice. It's just a set of points. It's like, um, it's like a John Cage piece, you know, uh, a bunch of rests. So if I, if I go to the piano and I play rests in 5-4 time, listen. Isn't that great? Oh, man, it's fantastic. All the different rests and different. So this is a set of lattice points. Now we're going to put something on them. You think I'm kidding. I'm not. All right, now what's the basis? What's the basis? What's the basis? If I put a single atom, if I put a single atom, we have what's up in the slide. What's in the slide? Single atom. And so that's the representation of metals. So for example, gold is FCC with a single gold atom at each lattice point, aluminum, copper, platinum. These are all FCC metals. So there's a single atom at each Bravais lattice point. And so the crystal structure, the crystal structure is known as FCC. It's the same as the Bravais lattice. It's called FCC. OK. Now, we can also put a molecule. We can put a, mo put a molecule at each lattice site. So I'm going I'm to put up the FCC here. So here's FCC. There's the cube, a set of lattice points. And the lattice points are, I'm going to just illustrate on the front face, one, two, three, four, and a fifth atom at the front face. Now, these are the points. I could either put simple atoms there, and the central image there shows what happens when you have the close packed arrangement, the atoms are so big that they touch. Or what I could do at each lattice point, I could put a molecule. So for example, I could put methane. I could put CH4. A methane molecule. You know, if you know, when one of you gets to Jupiter and you see the the, the methane ice, and you go, oh, that's FCC, because everybody else on the mission hasn't taken 3091. They don't have a clue what they're looking at. But you, you go, what's well, face-centered cubic? And they go, huh? And this is, this is at each lattice site. You see, my point is, now look, here's the difference. All five of these, the carbon and the four hydrogens, sit at this lattice site. All five atoms sit at this lattice site. It's not that the carbon goes here, one hydrogen goes over at one lattice site, one hydrogen over here. You don't have the, the methane straddling the unit cell. You have all five atoms here, five atoms here. At every lattice point, I have all five atoms at each lattice point. So in that case, we also have its FCC. So Methane ice is face-centered cubic. Because it's spherical. They pack. They pack just like gold atoms. It's, you know, from a distance, we can model this as a sphere, as a point. Or we could put an ion pair. We could put an ion pair. And the example of that is sodium and chloride. And this is called rock salt crystal structure. Rock salt. Let's look at that one. So at each lattice point, I'm going to put two ions, not one, two. So this is taken from your text. So you might look at this and say, well, here's the front, all right? You might look at this and say, well, isn't this kind of like simple cubic? Because I've got one, two, three, four, but I've got different atoms if I try it that way. See, this is taken from a different book. I, I did some highlighting on it. So this is sodium chloride again. One, two, three, four, five. With this lattice site, I put the chloride atom and the sodium atom. The pair of atoms are associated with this lattice site. And you might say, yeah, but this is way over here. Doesn't matter. I'm going to 
anchor all of those to this lattice site. To this lattice site, I'm going to anchor this and the sodium ion. So it is not simple cubic, because if I try to call this simple cubic, I have different atoms at different lattice sites, and that's a no-no. It has to be the same. So if I associate the pair, chloride ion and sodium ion, chloride ion and sodium ion, chloride ion and a sodium ion not depicted, it's off the, off the diagram here, and I put these dots at the center of each chloride ion, can you see that I'm making the face of FCC? So that's an FCC Brave lattice, but it's got two atoms, in this case both ions, associated with each lattice point. Now we'll come to the dogs in a second. And now there's a last one I can do. There's a last one I can do, and that's got, that's got two atoms, but not an ion pair. I'm going to put an atom pair. We've got an atom pair, and that looks like this. That looks like this. I'm going to put a carbon atom, one carbon atom, and a second carbon atom, and this angle here is 109 degrees. And I'm going to put this pair of carbon atoms together, and when I do that and I replicate that through FCC, I end up with diamond cubic. Diamond cubic. Diamond cubic. And I'll, I'll show you a, I'll show you a, a three-dimensional example of that next day. So but just, just bear in mind that if you have an ion pair, you end up with rock salt. If I show you the, this pair, this is due to the sp3 hybridization. And so examples of this one are, are diamond, not graphite, just diamond, silicon. So everything that I've shown you about single crystals and intrinsic and extrinsic semiconduction is diamond cubic crystal structure. But it's not one of the Brave lattices. It's an FCC Brave lattice with two atoms per lattice site. That's diamond cubic crystal structure. OK. But it, you know, it extends to two dimensions. So here's an Escher print. It's got all these dogs. You know, in two dimensions, what's the crystal structure here? Well, in, you know, there's no such thing as body-centered cubic. There's no third dimension in, in, uh, body, in uh, two dimensions, right? So you've only got body, uh, pardon me, simple cubic or face-centered cubic. So what do we have here? Well, you can't, you see, you've got a problem because the black dogs are facing the opposite direction of the white dogs. So you can't go one, two, three, four and make anything that way. So instead, I put dots at the, on the, on the, on the I don't know, what do you call this part of the dog? I don't know. You know this, this part of the dog, the leg, whatever you call this thing. Yeah, you put it in the same spot of the dog. Maybe I should have used his eye. I didn't know how to call it. Anyway, so I put these things up, right? And that means that if I associate the four dogs with this point, the two dogs facing the right, and these two dogs facing the left. So these four dogs are associated with this lattice site. Then I move up here, and I've got the same thing. One, two, three, four. Two dogs facing right, two dogs facing left. So that means I've got, I've got a simple cubic Brave lattice, and the basis is four dogs. Four dogs is my basis. And with that combination of a simple cubic lattice, and four dogs is the basis, I can make the entire structure. That's what this is all about. That's my unit cell. That's my repeat unit. So there's simple cubic right there. So instead of a single atom at each corner, or these are spheres that are touching, we got the four dogs. Here's another one. Once we got to Escher, I kept flipping through the book. I don't know what this thing is, but it's creepy. Anyways, it's, it's wallpaper. If it's wallpaper, it's ordered. If it's ordered, it's a two-dimensional crystal. If it's a two-dimensional crystal, it has to conform to one of the 14 Brave lattices. So which one is it? So I looked at this for a while, and I took this uh, happy entity here, and I put a dot in its belly, see? So wherever I found one of these, I put a dot, and then I connected the dots, and what do I get? I get the rhombus. Now, what's the basis? That's the, that's the Brave lattice. What is the basis? So I went over here and I said, well, what if I, if I start from this thing and I go all the way up, I got some tail, blue tail here, and this thing way down here looks like it's missing a tail. So if I start from this, go all the way down to here and capture all of this material in between and associate it with that lattice point, that can be my basis. And then I take that set of 
imagery, and I put it on top of this, where it's centered about this thing's navel, and put it around here. You can see the translation is obvious there, and the translation is obvious here. There's the wallpaper. So it's part of a brevet lattice, only in two dimensions. You see? This is crystallography. That's all it is, crystallography. All right. So the next thing we have to do, it's kind of, it's a little bit boring, but you need to know this stuff because it's, it's formative for the, next, for the next unit. It's the characteristics of cubic lattices. Now, what do I mean characteristics? I mean the geometric characteristics. So there's a table here that I've taken out of your archival reading. This is the, if you go to the website, there's a, a set of notes that were written by my predecessor, Professor Witt. And if you go and look this up, in this, this unit on crystallography, there's this table, and it, it shows such things as the unit cell volume. Well, what's the unit cell? The unit cell is this cookie cutter cube that's the repeat unit, and it has a dimension here called A, which is the lattice constant. It's the lattice constant. It's the size of the box. All right? So what's the volume of the unit cell? Well, duh, it's A cubed. That's obvious. All right? It doesn't matter with a simple cubic, face centered cubic, body centered cubic. How many lattice points per unit cell? Well, that's how many, how many atoms do I get per unit cell? If you look at this, you'll say, well, gee, it's, you know, if you got simple cubic, you got them at the eight corners, so it's eight, right? Well, no, because each atom on the corner is inside this cell, but it's also inside the neighboring cell, and it's inside each of the eight neighboring cells. So I have eight times one eighth. So the, the total amount of atom within the cube is only one. That's why you got to go through this derivation. So here's an example for face-centered cubic. You see the corners? One, two, three, four. There's eight of those. Eight times an eighth is one. And then you got these atoms on the face, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Six faces. So, but each of these atoms on the face is only half inside the cube. The other half is in the other cube. So I got six times a half is three, and that gives me four. So that's, that's how you go through and figure out what's going on. And then you can look at things like nearest neighbor distance and what's the relationship between the radius if you're looking at hard sphere packing. So here's a good example. See, here's the hard sphere packing model. So I've got atoms all the same size, and they're packed to touch. And they're packed to touch so that in the end, I end up with a face-centered cubic arrangement. And so what's the relationship between the radius and the lattice constant? And yeah, it's just simple trigonometry, right? 4R equals 2a squared, and you go through it, and that, that's how you end up with all these formulas. So that's what's going on here. All right, so I think we're going we're gonna to move to the last five minutes here. So I, just a couple of comments. Today, we played music when you came in. It was uh, uh, Burning Down a House, an old piece by Talking Heads. Why was I playing Burning Down a House? Well, I want you to study this painting. This is a painting by Georges Braque from 1908. And it's called The Houses at Lestac, or if I speak Canadian, The Houses at Lestac. And you see the thing about these houses? You see the ones in the background have better definitions than the ones in the foreground? And, and the, the ones in the foreground are all distorted, and they're kind of falling over? Well, when this was exhibited at the salon, the critics lambasted it. They said this thing is absolutely childish, and one of the critics said, this isn't a painting of houses, this is nothing but a stack of cubes. And from this painting and that negative comment came the term cubism. And so the entire movement of cubism comes from this. And since we're studying the properties of cubic crystals, I thought the connection was pretty tight. And that's why I chose that piece. Uh, it don't go anywhere yet. We still have a couple of minutes. So there's, it's, nothing, it's not better out there than it is in here, I, I guarantee you. All right, so now I want to show you one of the properties. Why do we care about atomic arrangements? Suppose some of you are interested in fiber optics. One of the things you have to do in fiber optics is make junctions, because you can't run a cable 100 miles without making some junctions. Well, atomic arrangement reflects microscopic properties. And one of the properties that you can have in a crystal is something called birefringence, depending on the atomic arrangement. So what happens is if you have a ray that comes in from the left here, it splits into two. And that's no good in certain instances. In other instances, if you want a beam splitter, you want something birefringent. Right? So look at all these crystals. Quartz is birefringent. Ice is. You've seen it. Calcite is birefringent. And what do I mean by that? Well, Dave, can we, can we cut to the document camera? 
All right, so here's a, here's a crystal of, well, this is my handwriting. Oh, it's beautiful, right? Oh, let's write, here's Bohr. Isn't that beautiful? Jeez. Okay, not, enough about me. Now let's, let's, all right, so this is birefringent. Ooh, but what happens if we rotate it? We can change the degree, and if we're really clever, if we're really clever and we get it onto the optical axis, we can actually get these things to superimpose. Here's a piece of cryolite. This is the stuff they make aluminum out of. It is all aluminum in it, and you can see that, see, I loaned it to somebody, and they dropped it. And when they dropped it, they damaged it. That's what happens with some, see. Look at it, it's all crunched up there. But anyways, uh, I don't want to get into that. But so you can see if we turn this and we get it right on the optical axis, we can actually make these things line up sometimes. Anyways, so you can see the property of birefringence as, as one thing. Okay, next, uh, let's go back to documents. Uh, Dave, one more, one more thing. Birefringence. Okay, last thing I want to show you, you know gold, gold looks like this, it's yellow, right? Well, depending on how you, you know, those of you who uh, have seen certain uh, wedding bands know that if you want to make a white gold, you add nickel to it, and once the nickel content gets above a certain level, the gold looks white, in other words, uh, just metallic reflective. Uh, in Eastern Europe, it was common to add high levels of copper, in which case you'd get a beautiful rose-colored gold or pink gold. I'm going to show you some blue gold. I'm going to show you something that's not just, this isn't a joke. This is 14 carat. It's 40 plus percent by weight gold, and the balance is indium. And when you add indium to gold, you get blue. Document camera, please. Just so that you remember. Okay. That's gold. This is gold foil, Rutherford, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this is. This is yellow gold, ho-hum. This is white gold, same deal, but with some nickel. Oh, it's reflecting off of the yellow gold. Boy, there's a lot of yellow in here. Where's that coming from? It's hard to tell. All right, now let's look at some blue gold. This is blue. <laughs> so, but it's brittle. So I, you know, what are you going to do with something that's brittle? You can't shape it. So I have an idea. So here's my idea. See, what we do is, see this? What we do, instead of this, we put this. We drill a hole in it. We put some hands on it. We sell it for a lot of money. <laughs> it's blue gold. It's blue carat gold. What you can do if you understand crystallography. All right, get out of here. I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>